Um, so the general format that we're going to do here is uh, I'm going to talk briefly, very briefly about PPAN. Uh, Joyce, our executive director, is going to talk a little bit about the bill that we're working on in this session. Becky Long, our lobbyist, is going to talk about the legislative process. And then we'll go into how you can help and get involved and take questions. Um, we do have a couple of legislators here, I see. Let me um, make sure that I have, I see Rep. Uh, we have Rep. Froelich as well. Rep. Froelich. I've got uh, Rep. Kip. Um, who else? I don't see, I don't see anybody else. If we I have Anna, somebody? who is an aide to Senator Hawkes Lewis. Right, okay. Um, one of the, who is one of the sponsors of this bill as is Rep. Kip, as is, uh, uh, um, who else? Um, Rep. Anyway, Froelich. You're gonna, you're gonna talk about that anyway, Joyce. So, um, so I want to just briefly talk a, a bit about um, uh, PPN so that you know, if you don't already know who we are and what we do. Um, we uh, do education, advocacy, and public policy work at the state and local level in Colorado. We're not a national organization. We're a, we're a state-based organization. So education might take the form of things like webinars on a, a wide variety of subjects. But um, also, you know, we'll do tabling at events. You might see us at a farmer's market someplace. You might see us uh, in schools. You might see us any number of different, um, different places. So, uh, you know, the education work takes a lot of forms. Advocacy. We're always advocating on behalf of, of pollinators and on behalf of human health in a variety of arenas. And it might be, you know, with how land is managed. Um, it might be, um, you know, what kinds of chemicals are being applied here or there. It might be around habitat protection. So lots of different ways that we do advocacy. And then public policy work, which is uh, what we're focused on today. Um, public policy work at the state and local level. So sometimes we're working with local governments to try and see if we can get them to uh, transition their land management practices to organic, for example, um, or you know, pass a pollinator resolution to try and um, help frame how it is that uh, their staff and their departments uh, manage their parks or their golf courses or, or whatever. So lots of different kinds of advocacy and also at the state level with um, uh, government governmental departments like the Department of Natural Resources or um, uh, the Department of Ag or Capital Grounds and you know the things like that. So and but then also we do uh, public policy work at the state legislature. So that's where we're focusing in today. Uh, if you want to, if you don't know much about us and you want to know more, please visit our website, peopleandpollinators.org. Um, so just to review a little bit about some of the legislative work that we have done in the past. Uh, we um, got our start actually working on the Pesticide Applicators Act Sunset Review back in 2015. That's actually how PPN got started. Since then, we've done a variety of things, uh, you know, certainly educating and meeting with legislators and getting to know them and helping them get to know us and the issues. Uh, sponsored a, a several a number of legislative breakfasts uh, that was pre-COVID. Um, uh, worked on the, got the I-76 Pollinator Highway uh, resolution passed. Last year, the pollinator license plate, which um, did successfully get passed and we did get awarded the contract. So that is hopefully gonna help us to establish a new habitat fund once, once the license plates actually go on sale, which is hopefully later this summer. So pay attention to that. If you are in the market for new license plates, you'll be able to get those nifty new pollinator plates with the um, bumblebee and the, and the blanket flower on them. They're, they're very cool. I got some prototypes, so it was pretty exciting to see them. Um, so pollinators, why are we concerned about pollinator, pollinators? Why do we wanna do public policy work around this? So things that directly affect pollinators are in their homes and their food, climate change, loss of habitat. Those are things that are huge issues for people as well. Those are issues for lots of different critters. Um, and then for pollinators, you also add in the chemicals that get applied in a variety of different ways in agriculture, in ornamental uses, in you know, residential yards. Um, and those chemicals uh, sometimes kill pollinators directly, or they may affect them over a long period of time. And one of, some of the things that they do do is to affect their immune systems and also the habitat issues and climate change issues that affect their, their homes and their food. All of that combined makes them much more susceptible to disease, to um, uh, other 
um, viruses, things like that, and makes them just that much weaker. So um, that is why we have introduced the bill that we've introduced this year. Um, we did try part of this bill two years ago at the beginning of COVID and the bill got killed along with many other bills when the legislature shut down. And so last year we focused on the pollinator uh, um, uh, license plate instead of bringing it back. And so this year we decided to come back with a, with a, a bill that was um, even more comprehensive than what we tried to do two years ago. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things that happened in the course of, of trying to get a bill across the finish line or even across the start line uh, in the legislature. And so Joyce is gonna talk a bunch more about that as is Becky. Joyce, did I cover everything you want me to cover? Sure, yeah, that was great. And just so everybody knows, we only have uh, Becky Long until one o'clock. So I'm going to do a pretty quick overview of the bill and we can circle back um, and answer questions and get into a little more depth during our second half of our webinar, just in case we run out of time um, with uh, what I wanted to let you know about the bill. So um, I'll just plunge into this. And if Sue, you can just keep an eye on the waiting room and admit people, please. So as Sue said, we are really, um, we really set out to take a broad approach to protecting pollinator and human health for this bill. We know we have enough information to act and that time is really of the essence with our overall loss of biodiversity. We're really trying to make that connection between human and pollinator health with this bill because we know that if it's good for one, it benefits the other. And so in the bill's introduced form, we have uh, provisions, and I'll just make a change here, that um, to protect children's health, preserve pollinator habitat and biodiversity, and allow communities to make decisions about pesticide use. And a bill of this size often evolves as you work on it. And uh, we get a lot of feedback from legislators and stakeholders and the public and state agencies. And we need to work through all those comments. So there will be changes, but I wanted to give you a brief description of what was originally proposed in the bill. And I'll just note, um, and we can circle back on some elements that will probably change. We know that passing legislation is rarely easy and it does take a lot of voices and hard work to get it done. The first element of the bill is a proposal to do a pollinator health study, which would be commissioned through the Department of Natural Resources to really document what do we currently know about pollinator health and populations? What's the existing research? What are our gaps in knowledge? How can we improve pollinator health? So really trying to clearly define what supports healthy ecosystems of pollinators and how that relates to human health as well. And then really hone in on how we can identify the specific decline issues here and how they can be mitigated in Colorado. And I'll just give you a second to read this quote from the American Academy of Pediatrics. The second component um, was a proposal to ban pesticide use on school grounds. We obviously want to reduce our children's exposure to toxic chemicals, particularly in a critical time of their development and for the sake of time at the moment. I'm going to refer you to a children's health webinar that we did uh, late last year. It's on PPAN's YouTube channel. Really great in-depth discussion with national experts about all the um, ramifications of children's uh, exposure to chemicals. This part of the proposal probably will be eliminated from the bill, but we think it's a great launching point and education point to educate people about this issue. And moving on to the next element quickly, you may know that many of our commodity crops are coated with neonics. They're the systemic insecticide that grows into all parts of a plant. And for purposes of an example, 
um, more than 90% of our corn is coated with neonics. There are other coatings, but this was going to be targeting uh, the neonic coating. This map shows the increase in the amount of imidacloprid, which is one of the neonics just since 1994, particularly in the middle part of the country. And when we're using a lot of these insecticides, um, a small part gets into the plant, but a whole bunch lingers in soils. Uh, it doesn't break down, it gets into our water courses. And the prophylactic use of these seeds can often cause the targeted pests to become resistant. And then we end up using more uh, chemicals as a result. And of course, our beneficial insects are also impacted by these chemicals. So um, trying to think about a way to uh, address this issue uh, there was a pilot grant program in this uh, proposal th that it would allow agricultural producers an opportunity to test non-coated seeds with a small financial gain. Um, it's often hard to take risks with the fear of a loss of yields or the fear of a pest infestation. But it is important to note that studies show that uh, the use of these coated seeds in an arid climate like Colorado aren't necessarily increasing yields. We've heard good feedback on this concept. Uh, we think it could use some more development um, and maybe propose it again in the future as a more comprehensive program with a research element. So we expect this component of the bill to be removed. And then Sue mentioned there were two um, pesticide related bills that were interest, um, introduced in 2020. Uh, the first of those, and they were killed by COVID, but the first of those was uh, would have classified neonics as registered use pesticides. The idea be to get, being to get them out of the hands of consumers and off store shelves. This can be a great benefit because we know that uh, there can be a lot of overuse with casual users. And this bill also, um, I'm just letting somebody in, sorry. I can't seem to do it from my scream, Sue. So if you can do that, thanks. Uh, there were some other non-agricultural uses uh, limited for ornamental uses as well. And lastly, the repeal of state level preemption at um, was also introduced as a bill in 2020. Uh, it's brought back here in this bill. Currently, local communities do not have the authority to regulate pesticide use for the benefit of unique natural resources and public health. So a preemption repeal would return some of that control over pesticide use back to municipalities. And then they would have the option to use their local expertise to protect natural resources and public health as they see fit. Just as an example, it's a very different issue, but there was a repeal of the plastic preemption during uh, the legislative session last year. And so you will begin to see some communities having the um, doing some regulation over plastic use. And I just like to use that example um, there are a bunch of state preemptions and pesticide preemption is just one of them. So that, that was a, a mouthful and a lot to kind of soak in quickly, but I am going to pass it over to Becky now so that she can take it away for the last 15 minutes here of her time anyway. Hi, thanks Joyce, and I think I'm mostly just talking to y'all about process, so if folks have questions on process, let me know. Um, so I'm Becky Long, I work with PPAN, My, our firm is called Siegel Public Affairs, and we work in the building to help shepherd legislation through the process. So um, the bill, Senate Bill 181, has been introduced into the legislature um, with our sponsors, and it will have to go through 
a few steps before it is considered passed. The first step will be next week on March 3rd. The bill will be in the Senate Agriculture and Natural Resource Committee um, in the afternoon. There's some other bills up on the schedule, so we'll get a better sense of when exactly, but that committee starts at 1.30 and goes on. Um, if folks wanna testify in that committee, there is a link where you can already sign up to testify. I think Joyce might have that to pop in the chat, but if not, I can get that in the chat here in a moment. Um, where once the bill has been listed for committee, you can sign up to testify in advance. Typically, folks get two to three minutes for testimony, so it's good to prep in advance so that you're not caught by surprise when the timer runs out. Um, the link for signing up to testify includes both written testimony and in-person, as well as virtual testimony. All three are options um, on any bill. Oh, thanks, Rep. Kip, on it with the testimony link. Thank you so much. Um, what will happen in that committee is the sponsor will sit down and present the bill, um, likely talk about potential changes through amendments as part of that introduction and take questions from committee members. From there, the testimony phase will then start and the committee will hear testimony from any number of folks, both in support or opposition, maybe people who are neutral but have been asking for an amendment, things like that. Um, and they may ask questions of folks who are giving their testimony. They may not. It really depends on the member and, and the issue that's being brought up for testimony. Um, and then they'll vote on the bill and vote on any amendments to the bill they would like to pass at that time. From the committee process, assuming that it is uh, successful in that first committee, because this bill will require some funding in order to implement, we will also have to go to the appropriations committee. Um, those committee meetings are usually very quick. It's like rapid fire bill passage. There's not testimony on those committee um, hearings on any bill, um, but the committee will decide whether or not there are funds available to allocate to this program. And once we get through the appropriations committee, the bill can be heard on the floor of the full Senate um, for what's called the second reading or the committee of the whole. Um, and at that point, legislators can speak in support or opposition to any bill um, that's on the agenda for discussion. Um, and they will take a voice vote about that bill. They could run further amendments at that point if they so chose. Um, and then the following day, typically, or a couple days thereafter, um, the full chamber will have what's called the third reading vote, which is the official passage out of the Senate. Um, so assuming we cleared that whole process, then the bill will go to the House where Rep. Kip and Rep. Froelich will pick up um, the work in the House. Um, in some states and at the national level, um, often two different versions are passed, one in the Senate, one in the House, and then they're reconciled. Here in Colorado, we pass one version through the whole process um, and sort of check back with each chamber along the way. Um, so the House will be able to hear the bill in their committee process. It'll go through the same process again in the House from committee to um, the floor and then the final vote. If the House makes some changes, they'll go back and check in with the Senate, make sure the Senate is comfortable with those changes um, and we'll go from there. And then if both chambers pass it, we'll be on to the governor's desk for his approval and um, hopefully his signature to make this a law here in Colorado. Um, so that's the basic process. We're sort of at the first stop, which is our first committee hearing. First committee hearings tend to be where you have the big, the big conversations, the big amendments, the big um, debates in many ways. So our goal would be that we come out of that with some strong support for the bill and are able to move on. Becky, you make that sound so easy. Oh, we're just gonna go from this committee to this committee and then to the floor. And then we do the same thing in the house. I, I think that one of the things to always remember is that in any one of these stops along the way, that could be the end of the bill. And it's, it's sort of fraught with um, potential stumbling blocks. I hate to be uh, a, a negative about the whole process, but it is a very uh, challenging and difficult uh, process to get through. <laughs> Um, so I know that you have eight more minutes, Becky. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk at all about things that people can do to be most helpful before you have to yeah. leave? Yeah, I might touch on ways that we can help ensure that process is easier. Sue is spot on at any one of those points. We could fail to have enough votes and the bill could not move forward. Um, we'll be doing a lot of work myself and Melissa on my team to count votes and make sure we've got folks there as will our sponsors. Um, but one thing that really helps is one, for legislators to have heard about the bill from folks in their district first. So 
um, if you know your legislator has a town hall or you regularly weigh in with them about issues, sending your legislator who reps the area you live in a note to let them know you support the bill and you hope that they will too is really very helpful. Um, it always makes my job as a lobbyist um, a lot more interesting and easy when I go to someone and say, have you heard about this bill we want to do? And they say, oh yeah, I heard from a bunch of people in my district. Um, it gives them the context that people who um, they elect hope that they're working on issues like this. Um, can, you, can you remind us one more time what the bill number is? It's Senate Bill 131. Thank you. Um, so let folks know that's the bill you support. Ask them to support the bill if you're able. Um, and then the conversation will pivot into um, uh, potential amendments. You know, they may ask for questions on that process. So we'll be working through that. Joyce mentioned some of the amendments we think are coming and that we're working on that is one of the ways we can sometimes get support from legislators to get through the process is through making some, some changes to bill language and getting them there. Um, and then the last thing is that committee testimony. Um, coming to committee and sharing why you think the bill is important, why you think it can help your community is really helpful. You do not have to feel like a PhD expert in invertebrates or chemistry to testify in these issues. If you're, if you're not that person, that's okay. You have your own lived experience that you can bring to this conversation and that can be valuable and helpful. We will have some folks with big PhDs and backgrounds who will be testifying and that's great. Um, so when you're giving that testimony, you know, route it in what you see in the world around you and the reasons you support this bill um, and why it's important. Uh, I always recommend to folks that, you know, don't stretch for an answer if you're not sure. It's totally okay to let a legislator know you don't know the answer. I do that all day long because um, <laughs> I can only know so many things at a time. Um, so you can feel free in testimony if you get a question to say, you know, I don't know that, but perhaps someone else testifying today could help. Um, if you know the answer, you can certainly give the answer. Um, and just, you know, really route that in your, um, ground that in your experience and the issues you know. If you have more information you'd like the committee to look at and you want to hand that out, you can do that in advance of the committee. You can email them that information or you can bring it with you. And I would just maybe ask, I think we still have Rep Kip on, if she has any advice for what's the most helpful testimony you hear as a legislator. Um, well, it's always really helpful if um, like somebody on the committee is representing you that you say, yes, yeah, so-and-so is my legislator because we all pay more attention to our constituents than we do probably to anybody else. So it's always really helpful if um, that's the case. And the other thing, um, you might have mentioned this, Becky, but we have remote testimony now. I mean, that's one silver lining of the pandemic. It sort of opens up the process to everybody in the state. Um, so that link that we have in the chat, you can sign up for um, in-person or remote or just um, some written testimony. So we welcome um, everybody to be part of the process. So um, just thank you uh, for your interest in this issue because you know it's one of the things that um, we need to keep making improvements on in the state. And as far as I'm concerned, while I'm in the legislature, that's gonna happen, so thank you. You know, one of the things that I, that I would say about this whole process too is that um, even if we don't get across the finish line in the form that we wanted to, the process of getting there, of educating people and just continuing year after year to bring up these issues, help people understand what's happening because you know, we know out there in the in the world that, you know, there's lots of charismatic pollinator species like monarch butterflies and honeybees and whatnot that people get all excited about. And, you know, it's exciting when there's so much support for a pollinator license plate bill and let's protect our pollinators. But then when we get down to the actual um, pieces of doing that, it people have to do some hard thinking about their own behaviors as as land managers, whether it's your own backyard or whether it's a municipality. And that's where things get harder, but the more we can just keep educating and talking about the issue, um, the better. And sometimes these things take some time to get across the finish line and sometimes they happen right away. So we're gonna be hopeful that this year it happens without too much too much challenge and, and, and we get at least some, some of the things we wanna get across this finish line. Um, Becky, do you wanna talk about what people can do like with their local governments? Yeah, thank you. I think that's one other piece we know is really important to this bill. This bill would allow local governments some ability to engage in this space. I know um, PPAN has lots of 
supporters who've been trying to get local ordinances passed in different places and have run into the challenge where your local government may not be able or interested in doing that because of this preemption that exists currently. If you've been doing that work and you think you've got a local government partner who would like to do some things in this space, reaching out to them to ask for their support of the bill would also be very helpful. Um, so just would encourage folks to follow up with local community folks you've been talking to, ask if they've looked at it, ask if they can support it, and if they can come talk about what's helpful. There's a lot of concern about what various local governments may do, that it could be a really wide variation of um, things that come together. And so the more real examples we can put to that, the better. It's just really useful to um, be able to highlight the common sense kinds of protections most local governments are contemplating. Yeah, I think a good example of that is um, up in Vail. Uh, uh, I don't know, is Pete on? I don't think Pete's on here. But um, they were they were really having some struggles in, and they are having struggles in Vail with, um, what's the creek that goes through Vail? Anyway, that goes through the middle of town. Um, HOAs uh, sp um, spraying chemicals on uh, their HOA properties adjacent to the water and causing fish die off. So fishermen who were doing, you know, guided fishing um, trips for tourists and whatnot were uh, unhappy about that. But the the community couldn't do anything about it. The town couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't ban that that practice. They couldn't uh, do anything to try and keep the chemicals from from being applied so close to the water. Um, that's just a that's one example of. Um, of preemption, uh, the the lack of the, the preemption that keeps the local community from doing something that then affects um, uh, the tourist industry, that it affects the recreational industry, and 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 causes people who might not otherwise think about these issues to go, oh, this is a problem. So there are a variety of examples out there. Um, uh, other stuff, Becky. I know you have to leave. Um, other things that you want to bring up before we. We'll we'll continue this conversation after you're after you've gone, but uh, give you the last word here before you have to go. No, I think that covers it. If folks have other questions on process, Melissa on our team will be here and can probably help answer those. And um, great to see folks, and hope to see more of you at the committee hearing. Great, thanks, Becky. I think some of the other things that people can do um, to uh, support this this bill in addition to you know your local government whatever wherever you live uh in the state is uh constituency groups um you know anything any groups that you belong to or that uh have um have members that will support it if the group will endorse the bill we have a, a google form i don't know um uh joyce if you can put that in the chat uh groups can sign on to uh, and just fill out that form to to endorse and, and be able to add your name uh, to the list of endorsers. So the more that we can show legislators that we have uh, groups in uh, in addition to, to governments um, that we have groups that have members um, that support it, uh, the better. So that's that's really another thing. Getting your friends and family to you know write letters to the editor in your local paper, do those kinds of things, post on social media. Uh, really get the word out because the more we can create, um, you know, some some noise out there, uh, the more people hear about it, and the better it is. Um, so, uh, Rep. Kip, do you want to say anything at all uh, more than what you've already said? Well, <laughs> you haven't I'll, really I'll had a chance add, yet. I'll, I'll just add one comment, and you know, we have a really awesome lobbyist with um, Becky Long. We have a really great group um, in PPAN and a lot of um, people who support the environment, but the the big money is really behind where um, the people who reduce pesticides and and the people who are in communities that feel like they might get damaged by this bill so um i see in the chat somebody said seems like we might want to foresee the reasons that this bill would get voted down and yeah we're, everybody's working on that and there are legislators who for instance represent agriculture and i've heard so much about the slippery slope right and um, we hear about that a lot um but just you know, it, it helps to hear from constituents. So if you have whoever your representative and senator are, you know, um, especially if they're serving on the committee, um, I think it's the Agriculture Committee in the Senate that will be hearing the um, bill next week. If any of those folks are, um, are represented by you, please do weigh in. Or if you know somebody who's in one of those areas who would like to weigh in, that's just really an important thing. Um, it, 
everybody listens to their constituents more than they listen to other people. So, you know, I get, I'm, I'm from Fort Collins. If I get emails from somebody from, to, from Grand Junction, it doesn't count as much as if I hear from somebody who's in my district. So just wanted to throw that out there because your advocacy can really make a huge difference on a bill like this. This is one of those where you really need constituent support to counteract the um, big money types of lobbyists who are working um, against this bill. Right. Yeah, I think that's that's really that's very true. There's um, uh, a lot of, you know, the big corporations that, um, you know, make their money from from chemical agriculture and and just uh, chemicals in general. Uh, they have a lot of money. I mean, you just think about uh, think about those cute cartoon ads that you see on TV for for Roundup and, you know, killing the, the that nasty dandelion or whatever that's in that's growing in the driveway crack or, you know, you think about those and, you know, we're we're a small group and we don't have that kind of money to run ads that, you know, change public opinion and get the public to really um, believe that chemicals are absolutely necessary for growing food and for, um, you know, ornamental use in, in people's yards. And it's a big industry. And so it is sort of a David and Goliath situation here. Uh, but, you know, I think that we have a lot of good public opinion on our, on our side of people who are really concerned about the excessive use of chemicals and how much that has changed our environment and how much that affects human health as well, including children, um, and especially children. So I, I think, you know, you don't have to, as we've said, you don't have to know the um, minute details of, of the bill or, you know, specific scientific um, issues in particular, but to, you know, put together a well-reasoned argue, argument about why pollinators are important, why chemicals might be affecting pollinators, and we need to think about ways to do things differently. It, the message can be really as simple as that. Um, so, um, Joyce, did you want to jump in here before we sort of go into uh, some chat and questions? And I, I think we don't have any other legislators on. They're all probably back in committee at this point, right? I would just add, we sent out an e-news last night that had some more resources for connecting. If you don't know who your legislator is, there's a link to it there. We have a template for um, just some guidelines on testifying. I think something that's important is just, it, you don't have to be a total expert, but having something unique, a story, an experience, and that if you are testifying um, and there's a lot of similar testimony, it's all oh, it, kind of good to skip over things you've heard before you and get to the unique points. So that's something to keep in mind. If anybody um, would like, to testify and would like some additional guidance, we're available to support you. You could submit that in advance to us. We can have a look at it. Um, yeah, so uh, more resources. If you are not currently on our e-news list and would like to get a copy of that, of what we sent out last night, uh, please let me know, or I'll, I'll put my email in the chat so you can write to me and I can forward that to you. Um, that, oh, somebody did ask about a template for speaking to legislators. And that's kind of like a mini testimony in a way. If you're calling or writing to your legislator, you will indicate the bill number that you're interested in supporting. You'll let them know why you support it. Uh, make sure to give your name and where you live so they know that you're in their district. And um, that's, that's really the format for contacting legislators. I think I've heard Rep Kipp say that she's a person too, and, and you can just come and speak to her. <laughs> I hope I have that right, Rep Kipp. <laughs> yeah, and I'll just say some people like to hear from their constituents by phone, some by email, you can do both, you can do whatever, but um, you know, just, just the point is to reach out. Well, in testimony, it, it is, it's great to have people there in person. It's so much easier now to be able to do remote testimony as well. But, you know, written testimony is useful too. So you can, you know, send an email, send something to all of the legislators on a particular committee that uh, is going to hear a bill that you're concerned about. Um, so you can, you can do that too. Um, I, I, I know that um, Senator Hakas Lewis's aide was on here. Uh, there she is. Um, so tell us, uh, do you, 
uh, when you get letters or emails into the office, do you, do you read them and do you pass them on to um, the senator? We do, um, especially if they're in our district again. Um, okay. Yeah, that's, that's kind so, of what it is. So if it's, a, but if it's a bill, I mean, not this bill, but if it's a bill that um, uh, somebody in the district is, is concerned about, um, do you factor that into a vote uh, if it's a written testimony as opposed to testifying at, at, a, at a hearing or something? Um, I haven't dealt with that, okay. sorry. <laughs> I, I wish I could answer that for you, but if, if I could just say, you know, a lot of times I will receive um, emails or I mean, I, I'm better at email, but emails on either side of an issue. Right. I mean, there are things that I have my own values and I'm never going to vote against them or for them because those are where my values are. But if I'm if I'm iffy on an issue, that's where it's going to really make a difference. So um, that's. And, 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 and I do know, you know, people say, oh, well, you know, I don't know why we even bother going and testifying in committee because sometimes, you know, it, it, it's all just been decided. But I've been in a few committee hearings, not a lot, but a few where the outcome was not what everybody thought it was going to be going into that committee. So testimony really can make a big difference and hearing from your constituents can make a difference. And it, I mean, it's like if, if it's something you're adamantly opposed to and you're never going to be there, yeah, that's not going to happen. But if it's something where, well, I'm not sure I have these concerns. It can make a difference to hear from your constituents. Great. That's good to know. It's good to hear that you actually do read your emails or somebody in your office reads your emails and passes that on to you. That's, <laughs> you read them yourself. Well, wow. That's great. Good to know. Okay. Um, so I think at this point, uh, it'd be great to open it up to, to questions and, and chats. I know two people have their hands up right now, but I don't know if that was left over from before or not. Um, uh, Crystal or... Nancy, do you have still have questions or because your hands are up? Mm, okay. I don't have a question, so I just left my hand up. Sorry for that. Okay. okay. Uh, Nancy Brothers, it looks like. Do you have a question? Okay. Uh, I'm gathering not. So um, other folks uh, have been asking questions in the chat. So uh, does anybody have any questions that you want to bring up or, or comments or things you want to share with the group? I see one question was asked about neonics and the bill, it said no proposed ban on the use and sale of new Nick, neonics in big box stores. This actually would ban the sale of neonics for consumers. So it would take it off the shelves of big box stores. Yeah, as as uh, Joyce uh, said earlier, that um, in in thinking about the neonic usage, I mean, a lot of it is uh, coated seeds and agricultural uses, both foliar sprays and and coated seeds. But a tremendous amount of usage uh, that is really goes unregulated is um, residential or um, you know business business land management uh, that people do not have to be um, applicators, certified applicators to actually apply them. They can just go to the store and buy the product and put on as much as they want. And when they do that, or when we do that, um, as, as consumers, uh, that, you know, that goes into the waterways just like agriculture use does. And, and frankly, the application per square foot is much higher in residential and suburban areas than it is in agricultural areas because um, for the most part, agricultural users uh, one only have they been trained in the application. It is true that sometimes they don't follow those, uh, those rules around it, but they've been trained in the application and it's an economic issue for them that the more they uh, spend to apply chemicals, the, the smaller their margins are. In residential use, a lot of times people just, you know, they look at the label and say, oh, a little bit is good, a lot is gonna be better. And so being able to, um, try and regulate that kind of use is, is really important. Okay, other questions? I don't currently see any others in the chat. So people are welcome to come off mute if they'd like to ask a question. Yeah, um, I had a question. I, 
I think it was you guys years ago that did, um, well, two questions. I'm thinking even grassroots, and I'm going to do it, um, even posting on Nextdoor, and there's a lot of things I stay away from on Nextdoor, but um, even posting this bill and people that are in support, um, you know, and what they can do and putting a link, you know, I think it can't hurt. But my other question that I had in the chat was, do you guys, did you stop sending emails on voting recommendations based on, you know, what we are united in believing in? Do you, do you mean voting for candidates for office? Yes. No, we've never done that. We're a, a 501c3 organization. We're not allowed to endorse candidates oh. for office. So we've oh. never, we've never posted that kind of information. Uh, you know, the way those rules work, if you don't know, is that 501c3s yeah. can do a small amount of lobbying, and that's what we do is a small amount of lobbying, but we are not a C4 organization, which would be an advocacy group, um, and we don't have an electoral arm at all. So um, that would be some other group that has done that kind of work. Okay, but not any that you know of then? Uh, well, Sierra Club, um, they uh, have a strong uh, interest in pollinator issues and they do do candidate endorsements. Oh, cool. Okay. So Thank Sierra you. Club, I mean, uh, Conservation Colorado, lots of other groups do candidate endorsement relative to um, environmental issues in a broad way, um, but not us. Other folks have questions? Comments? Anybody want to raise their hand and volunteer to um, testify? I have a quick question. Yeah. About um, the sponsor of this bill, are you are you all the main sponsor of this bill, and are there other sponsors, and how does that work? Rep. Kip. Um, yeah. So um, how it works is um, most a lot of bills will have a group behind them. So um, in this case, PPAN has sort of um, spearheaded and, and basically has a lobbyist who is helping us navigate the, the murky waters of, of the pesticide world. Um, but in every bill also needs to have at least one or two House sponsors and one or two Senate sponsors. So this bill is starting in the Senate. So your Senate sponsors are um, Senator Hawkes Lewis, who worked on me with, um, with a neonic bill a couple years ago that died with COVID. And then um, Senator Priola, who was also on that bill with us um, two years ago. And honestly, it's great to have him on a bill because um, it makes the bill bipartisan. He, um, Sonia is a Democrat and Senator Priola is a Republican. And in the House, we have two Democrats on it. And those are myself and I'm Representative Froelich. Thank you. So, when, so um, definitely being in touch with uh, the sponsors of the bill is good, but the other thing to really as, and your own legislator is really important, but also the members of the committee, because the first committee that it goes to is, is critical, because if it makes it past the first committee, you got a better shot of getting through some of the others, but if it gets killed in its first committee, it's dead in the water. So you really want that committee to go well, and that's where a lot of the first testimony comes out, and, and you know, so that Senate Ag Committee is, is a very um, important piece. Um, I see two other hands up. Uh, a three now, um, Cynthia first, and then Ingrid, and then Andrea. Um, um, yes, I would like to know if providing uh, photographs of one's garden would be appropriate here, you know, to be included in a letter or an email uh, about what you can do if you don't use any pesticides in your garden. Well, I know people always like looking at pretty pictures of flowers for sure. Um, but I think if it's accompanied by, um, uh, you know, the relevant points that uh, I, I'm able to grow this kind of yard without the use of pesticides, I don't know. Sure. What do you think, Rep. Kip? Um, you know, it, it depends on on the legislature. I, or legislator. I, I think what makes a difference to people is um, making sure that the interests of their constituents um, are going to be represented. And I see a message here about um, what's the email address of the Senate Ag Committee. They don't really have um, 
Well, I guess they might have an address that you could write to the committee. If you click on that link I put in earlier and I can put in again, you will send testimony to the entire committee. But if you want to send an email to individual legislators, um, I will put the link here so that you will know who is on the um, agriculture Senate Agriculture Committee and you can send them an email. So, uh, Cynthia, one one other addition, to, uh, additional response to your question, I think, is that um, remember that legislators are are in any given session are dealing with hundreds and hundreds of bills, and you know they aren't experts in uh, all of those bills. <laughs> so, they um, so testimony becomes important, but they also don't have a lot of time. So, the more succinct and direct and clear you can be, and don't inundate with pages and pages and pages of testimony. So, I guess that might be an argument against um, putting photographs in, although photographs might capture their attention. So, you know, I, I, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. But I think what's really important is to recognize that that while they do have staff, they don't have a lot of staff, and um, and it's they they don't have a lot of time. And they're dealing with many, many, many very di different issues. So, right. I, I was just thinking in terms of one picture and saying how amazed I am at the diversity of life in the whole web of life that I see in this one little piece of land. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, I was thinking nothing more than one page total sure. with one Great. picture. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Ingrid? Yes. Hi. Um, just a quick add on to Cynthia. I think when you go in to submit a written testimony, you can upload a document. And I think there's a place to add attachments, but I'm not, not positive, but I think there is. Um, so I don't know how you were thinking of testifying, but I, I've been doing it a lot by written testimony on the, the links that Rep Kit has been putting in there, Kip. Um, so what, and it's pretty easy, but what I was wondering if you could answer me, Rep Kip, if we submit written testimony instead of in-person or video testimony, is that seen by the committee in time to even make a difference? It is available to the committee. I can't guarantee that every person on the committee is going to read every piece of written testimony. And they might have, they might say, oh, look, I have this many people who wrote in to me. And so it might be, it's probably, it's going to get noticed more if there is either, um, if you're, if you're like orally giving testimony. Um, yeah. Because sometimes, you know, we, we have this thing called the box and we, we That's right. put stuff in the box. And, right. and, and honestly, if I get an email to me directly, you could, I mean, that's something you might consider doing because I do see all my email. So if you email it and you submit it as written testimony, that's doing, what I've been doing. That might be a better way to do it because then it's more likely to get seen. Yes, I send in the written testimony and then I email it to everybody. <laughs> And I just wanted to point out to people that uh, Senator Jaquez Lewis is on the Ag Committee in the Senate. So, yep. yep. Okay. Okay. That's Thank it. You. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Ingrid. I see one more. Uh, yeah, I got another hand up here. Uh, and I got two more hands up. Andrea, yeah, go for it. But I just have a quick question, please. I would like to testify, I would like to provide um, testimony, but I'm just wondering do you think it's better to do it in person? versus remotely, and I'm happy to come and do it in person. I want it the best way. My, personally, I think it's probably best to do it in person because you can also oftentimes have side conversations, but, mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and, you know, and actually have some give or take in a way that you can't as easily uh, in remote, but, uh, um, but in the time of COVID, people may not be comfortable doing that, but uh, I, but I would have, I would ask Rep Kip to actually weigh in on that. What do you, do you think it makes a difference? I think both are valuable. Um, I, I would say that, you know, maybe incrementally it's better to be there in person, but honestly, the time and expense and everything of coming to the Capitol, we have a lot of people who testify remotely and we really appreciate it. And I think it's more important what you say than if you're there in person or remotely. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a huge shift to be able to testify remotely because you know, that's only that, as you said, is the silver lining of COVID that um, 
that we've been able to do that and because a lot of people were limited by not being able to make the trip to the Capitol and, and sit there for hours and hours and hours. And it's a lot easier to sit there at your desk for hours and hours and hours waiting to testify while well, you can do other things. Yeah, and uh, we're really rude here. We keep people waiting for hours that we're terrible. <laughs> and so I really apologize for that. And um, it's expensive to come and park in here if you can find parking. So, mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> you know, if when I was a school board member, I made a few trips down here, but I would have testified more often on bills if I'd had that remote option. Exactly. Um, got another. You, oh, sorry. Go ahead. One last question. How long is the testimony? Three or five minutes? Three. Thank you. Yeah. And they do cut you off. So and it can vary oh, by committee, just so you know. I mean, I've known if there's a lot of people to testify, sometimes they'll take it down to two minutes or some committees just do two minutes. Um, okay. I'm not as familiar with Senate, but it's probably three minutes. But um, I'm sure you guys can check with Senator Huck as well. But it, it can also, as you said, it can change. I've been in committee meetings where it started out as three and then there were too many people. So they you know, went down to two. So be prepared for that okay. and, and figure out what, what are your most important points are and get them in up front. Well, I think it's two. I really yeah. have two minutes, but. Okay. And, um, uh, and honestly, people appreciate brevity. I mean, if you yeah. write out a whole long speech, people might start tuning out. I mean, just because there's a lot. Yeah. If you give something that's short and impactful, that's probably a better way to go. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I see uh, Chris from Westminster something. Westminster Bee Club, maybe. Or... Yep, Westminster Bee Club. Thanks. Yep. Um, I, um, I, I don't know if triazide or um, ortho bug be gone has neonicotides in it, but um, one of my pet peeves has been uh, Home Depot selling bags and bags of this stuff for a buck or giving it away for free. Um, I don't know if that's pertinent to this, this discussion, um, but I've got, I've got picture evidence of that. Um, I, I do a little research on whether it, it contains neonics. Yeah, I'm not sure which product you're talking about. I mean, some some ortho products do have, have neonics, I think, but um, I'm not sure the specific one. Uh, and in my, my, Utah, is it an insecticide or is it an herbicide? It's an insecticide. Yeah. Um, I mean, the chances of it having a neonic in it are, are pretty high, uh, but check the ingredient list and and check that out because if if it does, then it would it would be covered under this bill is to something that that in my mind shouldn't be sold to people who don't have any training and don't know how to don't know how to apply it uh, so yeah. anyway other other questions here i have a question about the specific wording of the bill i don't recall if it banned specifically neonics or all systemics because i understand there are a few systemics that are outside the classification of neonics that we might be subject to a lot of greenwashing with people saying neonic free, but they're still using toxic systemics. We're always subject to greenwashing out there in the world. Uh, Joyce, do you want to respond to that one? There is a particular list of neonics that are in the bill with, and also sulfoxiflor is listed. That's one of those that is now considered a systemic um, some people will argue it's not. There are other systemics that are not referenced in the bill. That's the problem with selecting specific chemicals to ban because there's always others to replace it. And you know that's why we try to think more broadly about how we're managing systems in a mo more holistic way. Um, I think peeling off some of these neonics that are so prevalent in the environment and are used in such an overused sort of way is, is a good start. But we, we do um, have difficulty in picking out individual chemicals for banning. Um, yeah, okay. So other questions? We've got about four minutes left. I guess my last question, um, or my thought is, you know, on so many different levels in government, which the complications of government drive me crazy, is that we we don't um, we don't learn from other places, you know. So, like in support of this testimony, is there a town or a, a country or a city 
that we can refer to that has successfully had results? Yes. Um, you know, uh, we can refer to a variety of different things depending on which aspect of the bill we're talking about. But, you know, you can refer to some of the bans that um, have been put in place by the European Union. We can refer to other states in the, in the US like Maryland um, uh, that have successfully done some aspects of this. Minnesota, Joyce, what other, um, what other states have had success? New Jersey, didn't they just have a success? Um, um, yeah, New Jersey and New York are working yep. on some neonic bans and um, and extending it to some sales of coated seeds. Maine does not have preemption. So some of the communities there have surgically um, regulated some pesticide use for the benefit of natural resources like the Casco Bay, um, which of course is a prized resource. So you know those are the kinds of those are some examples. Yeah, I'm doing some research too about um, water quality is one of the biggest issues with neonics because they are water soluble. So, you know, the runoff goes right into the water supply. And so whether that's salt water issues, which obviously is not relevant to us, but um, relevant in other communities, but also, but our freshwater um, waterways is, uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a key issue. And back in the day, many years ago now, pre- Pre the previous administration, when the USGS used to do studies of of water quality, um, uh, in you know looking at neonics in the in the water uh, in runoff, and that's really one of the studies that led to a, a pretty clear conclusion a number of years ago that the runoff from suburban and urban areas, meaning mostly homeowner use, was as high or higher than agricultural runoff, uh, and. Uh, we don't get those maps anymore, although maybe they're back now. I don't know. I haven't actually looked. Joyce, do you know if those maps are back? Because the USGS used to put out those maps of, of um, you know, the water quality studies and, and use. I'm not sure, Sue, but that slide I showed with the increased usage of imidacloprid is one of the maps that disappeared and we just happened to have saved it. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think it's back. But, um, and it's not up to date because it really stopped, they stopped doing that um, pre-2016. Um, okay, we have one minute left. So I don't see any other really burning questions out there. So I just wanna uh, thank everybody and remind you to you know, do what you can, talk to your friends and neighbors, talk to your local elected officials, uh, reach out and contact your legislator. It's not scary. You can just send them an email. Um, and if you really want, you can call them, which is great. So you can actually be in a conversation. If you wanna testify, um, feel free to let Joyce know cause she's gonna try and just you know, help people make sure that they're getting the right points in and that we cover all of the points that we need to be making uh, because there are many. So if we don't repeat ourselves, that's a good thing. Um, so anyway, thank you all so much for attending. We really appreciate it and appreciate your support of PPN and, and uh, this legislative process. Thanks everyone.